Tonight on CBC Vancouver News. It's sort of a time lock capsule of, of racist attitudes from eras previous that kind of persist to today. Closing to decolonize. The Royal BC Museum shuts down parts of its exhibits also. I truly believe that we need a massive, massive shift in how we run sports in our country. Calls for more accountability after a former Whitecaps coach is suspended amid allegations of sexual misconduct. And... What have I posted? They said, we can't tell you for privacy reasons. And I, privacy reasons? You're telling me I posted it. What is the privacy issue here if you really think I posted it? A BC real estate agent runs into a wall with Facebook after someone hacked her account. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, thanks for joining us. The Royal BC Museum in Victoria is closing some sections of its galleries and embarking on what it calls an effort to decolonize. That move comes after Indigenous leaders called for the museum to become a welcome place for everyone. So what concrete steps are they taking? Our Isabel Regem joins us now to explain what does this change mean, Isabel? Dan, the museum's acting CEO says they will close some galleries on the third floor starting this month and in January close the entire floor. That floor is known as the First Peoples Gallery and largely comprises Indigenous exhibits. And the CEO says this also means giving some things back. The museum will consult with First Nations to appropriately repatriate and conserve certain items. Closing these exhibits is necessary, he says, to better reflect the narrative of these lands and tell that story from more than a British and settler point of view. A number of underrepresented um, groups who have been part of, a major part of building modern British Columbia, um, their stories, their lived experience through history isn't as fully explored, isn't as fully included uh, in what has been a largely uh, European uh, settler narrative. Musica became the acting CEO earlier this year when the former CEO stepped down after allegations of racism from Indigenous staff. Isabel, those latest, the latest decisions today come after an independent investigation into those allegations earlier. What did they find? Dan, a 33-page report was released by the BC Public Service Agency in June. It found Indigenous staff and other people of colour were discriminated against and it upheld those allegations of racism. It also said the museum's core galleries, particularly the human history exhibits, are outdated and that some displays are offensive and reinforce a narrow review of BC's colonial history. Troy Sebastian is one of the former employees who has called out the museum for its racism and he says that the First Peoples Gallery in particular needs to change. It's sort of a time lock capsule of, of racist attitudes from eras previous that kind of persist to today. The former curator who is Tunaha says today's announcement is good news. He adds that he doesn't know if the museum has the systems in place currently to engage meaningfully fully, but knows that indigenous peoples across BC are willing to take part. The museum says this is a long term plan and that replacing the exhibits will take years. Isabel Regan reporting. Thanks very much. A former Whitecaps coach accused of sexual misconduct has now been suspended by Jamaica's women's soccer team. That country's football federation is asking FIFA to investigate his behavior while coaching here in Vancouver. As the CBC's Michelle Gassoub reports, it's the latest in a long list of troubling allegations from within the Whitecaps clubhouse. Stay on your feet, that's good, stay up. Former Whitecaps coach Hubert Busby is now suspended as head coach of Jamaica's women's soccer team. Last week, former Whitecaps player Mallory Enoch claimed in an interview with The Guardian that Busby sexually coerced and assaulted her while recruiting her to the Caps in 2010 and 2011 when he led the women's team. Busby denies the allegations. Enoch says she reported him to the club in 2011 only to have it swept under the rug. There are a lot of concerning things that happened around the club that really have to be uh, looked into and we have really to find out what that was. Whitecaps CEO Axel Schuster wasn't around at the time of the allegations but says he's committed to making sure an independent investigation is fully transparent. I would not put my face here in front of the camera if I could not do it the way I, I'm convinced of it's the only right way. 
Oh, he will. And that's it! It's not the first time the Whitecaps have been accused of covering up allegations of assault. In December, former coach Bob Berarda was charged with nine sexual offenses spanning 20 years. Like Busby, he was quietly let go after accusations were made. The floodgates are opening. Um, athletes and um, victims are feeling more comfortable to come forward, whether that's through the media or through um, an independent complaint management system, which is desperately needed. Allison Forsyth is a former Olympian who took her coach to court claiming abuse. She now advocates for athlete safety. I have an inside view of just how bad it can be in sport in Canada. Um, and so I'm not surprised, unfortunately. And I truly believe that we need a massive, massive shift in how we run sports in our country. Um, organizations must be held accountable. Individuals must be held accountable. Major League Soccer says an independent council will investigate how the Whitecaps handled the allegations against Busby from 2011. He also faces a potential FIFA investigation, which the Jamaican team says is needed to keep their players safe. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Vancouver. The Transportation Safety Board has sent investigators to look at that fire that destroyed several containers aboard the MV Zim Kingston. A fire broke out on the cargo ship two weekends ago off Victoria. It took nearly a week to contain it, in part because of hazardous, hazardous materials in the cargo. Days earlier, the vessel was caught in a storm that swept more than 100 containers overboard. Only a few, along with their contents, have been spotted on northern Vancouver Island shores. The Coast Guard says it suspects a good number of those containers have now sunk. A North Vancouver woman is calling for accountability and transparency from Facebook. Her account was hacked and she was kicked off the platform with little recourse. As Liam Britton tells us, she and others say it's an example of how social media companies operate by their own rules. It's bad enough when someone tries to hack your online accounts. But for real estate agent Patricia Houlihan, that was just the beginning. And I went into Facebook and couldn't get in. So then I thought, oh, that's weird. It said I was, I was locked out, I was banned, and I started frantically emailing Facebook, <laughs> right? Because, I mean, for business, it's, it's essential. I was panicking because I've lost all of those contacts, you know, the, all the ones on my business page, my four or 500 friends who are friends, family, etc. And how do you recreate all that? Her personal and business Facebook pages and her WhatsApp account were disabled. She was told she had posted inappropriate content. Houlihan had no idea what Facebook was talking about and wasn't given any more details. They said, we can't tell you for privacy reasons. I'm like, privacy reasons? You're telling me I posted it. What is the privacy issue here if you really think I posted it? She tried to appeal the ban but said no one would listen to her. I don't know how a big corporation like that can be so hard to get in touch with. It, it's, it's ludicrous, really. Seven weeks later, though, her Facebook was suddenly back. And once CBC News asked about her case, her WhatsApp was restored. She feels her case shows social media giants need to be more accountable to users. I mean, I fully support Facebook having community standards. I don't think people should be able to go on there and, and spread false news. It makes me crazy that they can. There has to be a way for them to differentiate between the person who actually is breaking the community standards and the person who's been hacked. Facebook is owned by the newly rebranded Meta Company, and they've confirmed that her accounts were banned by mistake. Now. Meta also owns WhatsApp, and since one of her Meta accounts was flagged, the company simply banned all of them. Yeah, I mean, she's right to be frustrated. Matt Hatfield is with Open Media, a nonprofit advocating for digital rights. We're, we're all frustrated. We're all frustrated that the primary online spaces that we, um, we use for speech today, uh, we have so little control or accountability over. Um, and I think in the long term, that needs to change. Houlihan wants stronger government regulations on social media companies. It has infiltrated all of our business and social interactions to such an extent that I think as members of the public, we deserve to be protected from them when they decide to randomly make a decision. At the very least, she wants users to get a fair hearing when they're banned. Liam Britton, CBC News, Vancouver. CBC News has once again compiled a list of the top earners at City Hall's across Metro Vancouver. It tracks staff earning $75,000 a year or more. At times, 
It can show just how representative or unrepresentative it is of the communities those governments serve. The person who actually puts the list together is our municipal affairs reporter, Justin McElroy. Justin, what did you find out this time? Yeah, Dan, you talk about representative or unrepresentative. It's really the latter. Uh, what we do every year is we look at the top 10 wage earners in city halls in the 21 municipalities in Metro Vancouver, and we see who they are, we track them, and we also put a gender and diversity lens on the findings as well. And when you do that, you see that 70% approximately of these top earners are men, about 90% are white, just 3% women of color. Needless to say, this is not how Metro Vancouver, the overall population of this region of two and a half million people look and when you look at the top wage earners the city managers the people making more than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars there are ten of those city managers in total again very much the same story so these are questions that all organizations big and small talk about it's something that we talk about for local politics when it comes to elected officials but unelected ones as well the same issues the same questions of municipalities trying to make themselves more diverse and to look more like the communities that they actually serve. On another front, we heard a lot last year about cities under financial strain because of the pandemic. Did that change anything for municipal salaries? Uh, it did in the city of Vancouver. There, the top earners decided to take a pay cut in order to help uh, with the possible financial implications of the pandemic, which thankfully did not come to pass. But in the rest of the big cities in Metro Vancouver, those wages continue to go up. And if you take a look at this chart here, it shows Vancouver, they went down slightly, the average for the top 10 wage earners. Everywhere else, though, went up by a little bit in Richmond and Burnaby, but quite a bit in the city of Surrey. They say that was just a facet of people bumping up to higher pay wages uh, that had already been agreed upon, some people become official on their position. But look, overall, year after year in most places, it certainly pays well to be at the top of a lot of these city hall power structures. Indeed, Justin McElroy, thanks very much. Thanks, Dan. An Asian giant hornet was found in a Japanese beetle trap in South Surrey two weeks ago. It was dead, and experts say it's most likely nothing to worry about. This hornet turned up about 200 meters north of the Canada-U.S. border. They suspect it came from the same nests that Washington state officials wiped out earlier this year. It has been sent to Ottawa for DNA analysis, though. It's thought to be too small to be a mating queen. If the results say otherwise, though, researchers will set off a buzzer alarm. Because that would mean that... Uh, the Washington state population, if they send out their sexually maturing offspring and they would then interact with our stock, if you will, of unrelated, genetically unrelated stock, that sets the stage for a viable reproductive population. Asian giant hornets turned up on Vancouver Island in 2019 and were destroyed. They usually prefer warmer climates, but experts say we shouldn't write off the chance of seeing more in our province. If you think you've seen one, you're asked not to try to kill it yourself and instead try to get a photo for researchers. BC is reporting 430 new COVID cases today, causing our rolling average to tilt down. Six more people have died, though, and the province's death toll is inching closer to 2,200 people. 137 people are being treated in critical care in hospital, and most of them, 85%, are not vaccinated. The province says due to a data error, it's not releasing the overall number of people in hospital until tomorrow. Northern British Columbians, meanwhile, are facing long wait times to find out if they are infected with COVID. For months now, the average wait time for test results has been 20 to 40 hours. Most people in other regions wait half that long. Some say they've been forced to take time off work to wait for their results. The Dawson Creek Chamber of Commerce wants the province to give businesses access to self-administered rapid tests or reimburse them to run the tests through private clinics. What we're experiencing in Dawson Creek and the South Peace is really um, difficulty getting in to get testing. So we're hearing some from some folks online up to two days before you actually get an appointment to test and then five to six days after that before you're getting results. BC does have a public program that allows companies to access rapid testing, but at least one epidemiologist says those tests should be widely available to everyone living in rural communities where COVID is spreading.
The Silka team, First Nation, is rejecting an apology from the mayor of Williams Lake. Last night, Walt Cobb told council he was sorry for diminishing the trauma of residential schools in a Facebook post. I never anticipated or intended to offend or make light of the residential schools. And for those I offended, I apologize and I'm seriously sorry, very, very sorry. In the post, Cobb argued there was another side to residential schools. Today, he repeated his apology, but told CBC News he's, quote, annoyed the First Nation made the issue public in the first place. The Silkatine called Cobb's apology disgraceful and are renewing calls for him to step down over this and other comments he's made online. The North Shore can expect to see more threatening landslides more often, says data from a Vancouver geoscientist. Over the next half century, the frequency could grow by 300 percent, and with it, the ferocity. Projections published in the journal Science Direct used complex modeling showing the compound risks of a changing climate and increasingly extreme weather patterns like rainfall, flooding and fires. The study's co-author says preparation is part of the solution. The key is to be very systematic about identifying the hazards, juxtaposing the climate change threat, determining where and if and how climate change will manifest itself, and then protect either existing development with appropriate structures or sterilize certain lands for development. He praises the management systems in place already to mitigate damage. In 2005, a deadly landslide swept down a North Shore escarpment after days of heavy rain, killing a woman. And meteorologist Johanna Wagseff joins us, I believe, from the North Shore with the forecast, Joe. Some interesting modeling there, right? Eh? Very, Dan, yeah. And this uh, increase in science connecting geohazards to climate change is one that's growing. Definitely increased risk, uh, risk to landslides because of layering of disasters. You know, a heat dome with stress trees followed by uh, increased rainfall through fall months, a pattern that we are currently experiencing. So I know scientists are watching that one closely. But yeah, speaking of rain, we're on our second of four low pressure systems this week. Let me take you to the radar where it was coming down heavily uh, through this morning. We were in a bit of a break uh, for the afternoon hours. And then the next round of rain just tracking in across Metro Vancouver as we speak. This next low sliding up our coast, actually bringing some lightning strikes to uh, parts of the island. We might even see those uh, in through Tofino in the next couple of hours. I don't think we'll get the lightning in through Metro Vancouver, but steady rain for a third night in a row through our overnight. I think we're getting used to that sound of uh, rain as we sleep. Temperatures are going to be the other story because as we continue to deal with rain in our long range forecast, temperatures are actually going to drop. Dan, right now it's been quite mild, but if you look at the trend, things coming down to seasonal and below for the weekend and beyond. So I'll tell you what that means for mountain snow and when, when we will see that flowing orb again coming up. <laughs> a few people are wondering, <laughs> Joe. Thanks. Just a few. You're welcome. Now that most of the world leaders have left the climate summit in Glasgow, the work is underway to turn their pledges into workable policy. That will be led by former Bank of Canada Governor Mark Carney. He's the UN Special Envoy on Climate Change and Finance. Chris Brown tells us more about his job to find the cash that will drive the global economy away from fossil fuels. With the presidents and prime ministers gone, the bankers took over at the Glasgow summit, pledging to lead a low emission global transformation. And right here, right now, is where we draw the line. Right here, right now, is where finance draws the line, private finance draws the line. Maybe I come see you. The agreement brokered by Mark Carney, Canada's former central banker, taps into a potential $130 trillion in financial assets, a lot of zeros, from 450 institutions, including Canada's big five banks. Those ideas and innovations and, uh, and investments that are going to work. In an interview, Carney said rather than telling investors where to make specific investments, this is about transparency and accountability. What's going to happen for RBC, uh, JP Morgan, uh, investors, BlackRock, investors around the world, is they're going to publish every year, these are the emissions of my clients, and this is my plan to get them down, and then people are going to be able to see whether or not they're going to come down. 
Can I ask you about Mark Carney's statement today about the global finance deal? We caught up with U.S. climate czar John Kerry, who suggested the explicit support of the financial sector has been a missing ingredient. We're very excited about it. I'm extraordinarily excited. But it's super important. It's the only way we get where we need to go. The target, which you see everywhere here, is to hold global warming to 1.5 degrees, meaning the world is now racing to find green tech that can lower emissions now to hit net zero, not in decades to come. A point underscored by the rep from tiny Antigua and Barbuda, who read his speech in Braille. And we, in the small islands, need you. Your failure to work with us would have been a failure for mankind. We thank you. What do we want? But activists who protested outside on the streets and inside, right beside the main hall, said there's nothing here stopping those financiers from continuing to bankroll dirty projects. Yes to new money, but what about the old money that's going into fossil fuel projects today? There are other gaps too. No banks in China or Russia. Huge emitters signed up. And it's unclear how accessible that money will be to the least developed countries who arguably need it the most. Chris Brown, CBC News, Glasgow. Two of the biggest names in professional sports infected. Sidney Crosby and Aaron Rodgers have both tested positive for COVID-19. What it means and how they might have been exposed, next. Thanks for sticking around during our commercial-free live stream. Hello to everyone watching online. Two waterways in the Cornwall area of Prince Edward Island have something new this fall designed to attract more wild Atlantic salmon. As Nancy Russell shows us, one of them is made from recycled material. This is where the Cornwall and Area Watershed Group is hoping more wild Atlantic salmon will want to call home, part of the North River watershed. Right now, Watts Creek is full of sand and fine silt, leaving nowhere for the fish to eat and live. It smothers all of the food sources. Um, it fills in all of the pools and the habitat, and you're left with a kind of a barren area. It's basically like a 401 for fish. They can just fly through it, but there's nothing really there that they can stop and, and you know, call home, I guess. This is called a rock deflector, installed here this fall. Using large sandstone rocks donated by the PEI Department of Transportation from the Cornwall Bypass Project. The rocks will deflect the water, improving the waterway for fish. So it's going to help that system, which is very straight right now. It's going to help uh, the natural meander return. It will also create pools on the downstream and opposite bank and those pools will attract large fish. This is another new project in the North River watershed. The water is diverted into the sediment trap, which filters out the excess sand and silt, especially in the springtime. Both of the projects are designed to help provide better habitat for the wild Atlantic salmon, a species that is currently struggling. There are species that's in trouble. There are species at risk. Um, DFO is currently considering, you know, listing uh, salmon on the island as a species of special concern, which is a, one of the categories under the Species at Risk Act. Hunter says using the recycled sandstone rocks is a bonus, especially on PEI, which doesn't have granite boulders used for many in-stream projects. I absolutely love it. I think this is a really nifty idea to be innovative. Um, um, one of the things that you have to do when you're trying to do conservation and restoration, you always got to find you know new and, and interesting ways to do things uh, and try and push the envelope. McCaskill says they will now monitor the areas to see whether the wild Atlantic salmon decide to call these waters home. Nancy Russell, CBC News, Milton Vale Park.
more players from the Pittsburgh Penguins have tested positive for COVID-19. One of them is Captain Sidney Crosby. This is despite nearly all players being fully vaccinated. And Crosby is only the second huge sports name today to test positive. Jamie Strashen reports on the breakthrough infection spreading in the NHL. After sitting out the first month of the season with an injury, superstar Sidney Crosby played his first game this week. Now he's out again, part of a growing list of Pittsburgh Penguins sidelined by COVID. I feel as, a, as an organization like we're trying to do everything we can to, to mitigate the risk. Um, and yet we're still getting it. Although all active players in the NHL are vaccinated, the Penguins are one of a number of teams who have been hammered by COVID. I said to them last year, we, we can do all the right things and, and still get it. And, and that's the reality, I think, of the world we live in right now. Defenseman Chris Letang is just returning after a severe bout of COVID. You see a, a guy that was really, really careful and he ends up getting it and you, you have no idea how he did it. Breakthrough infections among the fully vaccinated do happen. The question is, why so many cases in the NHL? I suspect they're getting pretty heavy doses of exposure. I think that would be the, the best way to make sense of this. And it is underway. Despite being fully vaccinated and in peak physical condition, NHL players are more susceptible than you might think. For one, they are rarely apart. I would want to look at what is going on in locker rooms, what is going on in hotels, which are really not very COVID safe, what is going on in buses and airplanes where these teams are going. They spend a lot of time together. Also, elite athletes like Crosby may be more prone to spreading COVID because they are elite athletes. They're very good at inhaling and exhaling. Your lungs are extremely efficient, and so they're pumping air out among everybody else far more efficiently than other people. Furness says the league needs to step up its rapid testing to detect cases before they spread throughout the locker room. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Canada's top court is deciding whether a B.C. man who allegedly ignored a woman's request to wear a condom should stand trial again for sexual assault. Today, the Supreme Court justices heard arguments in the case that could have far-reaching effects on consent and what constitutes sexual assault. A warning for you, this report contains some frank language. The CBC's Catherine Tunney has more. The court, la cour. Like many Supreme Court hearings, this is a matter of legal definitions. But for many watching, the stakes are intimately personal. At its heart, is sex with a condom legally different than sex without? Did the accused know that the complainant was not agreeing to sex without a condom? And did he go ahead anyways, unbeknownst to her? The original complainant said she insisted her sexual partner wear a condom. He didn't, so she went to police. The top court is now being asked to weigh in on the definition of sexual activity and what that means for consent. The man's lawyer argues it was a misunderstanding, and what I'm, not what I'm sexual assault. Um, if it was clear to her, it wasn't clear to the uh, accused. The trial judge found that there was no evidence of dishonesty. Interveners like Kate Feeney see it differently. She says the law needs to be more in line with the real world. If you've only agreed to sex with a condom and that agreement is violated, that means that you've been subjected to touching and um, likely contact with bodily fluids um, that you didn't agree to. And it's that core violation um, that core consent violation that we think needs to be recognized in the law. There's hope a decision will offer clarity about non-consensual condom removal, sometimes called stealthy, a practice some say is hard to prosecute. Some victims say it's even more difficult to get police to take it seriously. If you are confused if this is a crime or not, it's a crime. Anna DeBella says it took weeks to convince police what happened to her was a crime. I felt like my uterus was hijacked. Like, I didn't agree to any of these risks. I made that very clear. I felt just completely violated. Debella's case is now working its way through BC court, a case that could be easier or harder to prosecute, depending on which way the top court swings. She made it perfectly clear that she would only have sex with a condom. Misrepresentation, no? Well, that's what I call lack of subjective consent. A decision from the Supreme Court isn't likely until the new year. Catherine Tunney. CBC News, Ottawa. About a third of the people who have been treated for COVID are reporting ongoing problems with memory, concentration, and other cognitive abilities. 
It's not clear why. Irvi Kadopia looks at new research exploring the brain fog of so-called long haulers and how it degrades the mind. Since recovering from COVID-19 last year, Sonia Mali still suffers crushing fatigue and says her mind is trapped in a fog. I'm a fraction of the person I was before. Mally can't focus, struggles to remember, and has lost the creativity that inspired her art. It's sort of like trying to trudge through neck deep sludge, except mentally. Um, just it, you're tired, you're confused. In New York, researchers studied a diverse group of recovered COVID patients with in-person cognitive tests, usually reserved for those who've had a stroke or concussion. We did see cognitive impairment, which was in excess of what we would expect for this population, specifically, you know, this fairly young cohort. Almost eight months after being treated for COVID, 23% still had problems with memory recall, 24% struggled with forming new memories, and 18% had impaired mental processing speed. Hospitalized patients were most likely to be affected. The results are similar to the experiences of patients who've spent a lot of time in intensive care before the pandemic. Some studies have identified a subset that still has cognitive impairment over, over five years post illness, but we, we just don't know that with COVID right now. Scientists still can't identify the cause of brain fog, but autopsies reveal evidence of particles of the coronavirus, as well as damage similar to what's seen in strokes. I think we're, we're starting to get a sense of what the risks of each of those are and how much each are contributing, but I don't think it's gonna be any one thing only. No clear answer means no clear treatment. Nobody knows what's gonna to happen to any of us. Um, it's just kind of everyone's hanging on hope at this point. And a life sidelined. Vicadopia, CBC News, Toronto. Three days into COP26, a lot of promises made. And activists from around the world are in Scotland promising to hold them to their word. We speak with a BC representative of the Sierra Club after this. They were raising the roof in Vancouver today, the roof of Canada's first fully covered stadium. Jerry Thompson sends this report. If and when a roof is installed over Montreal's Olympic Stadium, the final price tag is expected to be about $750 million. By comparison, Vancouver's new stadium will cost only $126 million. It's on budget, on time, and an engineering experiment that worked better than the politicians could have hoped for. When Premier Bill Bennett pushed the button, the first of 16 compressors fired hot air into the canopy. That's the only kind of inflation we want in British Columbia. <laughs> and the 10 acres of Teflon and fiberglass began to expand. The roof alone weighs 46 tons. When you add in the steel cables, the lights and loudspeakers, it comes to over 200 tons, all held up by hot air. Engineers here made a virtue of necessity. Because Vancouver is in an earthquake zone, it would have been difficult and expensive to make a rigid roof safe. So they came up with a flexible top. It took two and a half hours to inflate all the way, but here's how it looks speeded up by time-lapse photography. For the price of Montreal Stadium, you could build five like this one in Vancouver. But all stadiums are controversial. Vancouver's presents a significant traffic problem, and the $126 million cost comes at a time when hospital beds are being closed and school budgets are trimmed to the bone. No parking. That's, no, That's I think it's foolish. Well, from what I see, it's simply magnificent. It's a big thrill. It's going to make its own money, they say. No, it's just away. She's never been in Empire Stadium, so she wouldn't know. <laughs> so what? So. When the engineers were sure there were no air leaks, they celebrated their success for all to see. Construction will be finished next summer in time for the 1983 Grey Cup football game. Jerry Thompson, CBC News, Vancouver. Santa Claus came to Toronto today and got a warm welcome from thousands of youngsters, but a cool welcome from the weatherman. 
In fact, it was the coldest day of the season so far, a chilly two degrees Celsius. The parade this year was sponsored by the City of Toronto and, as in past years, shown nationally on television. <laughs> Traditionally, the star of the show makes his entrance last, a joy to the kids and a reminder to their parents that Christmas is less than six weeks Merry away. Christmas. Well, hello. <laughs> And that's the National for this Sunday, the 14th of November. For CBC News, I'm Peter Mansbridge. Good night. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight for you on CBC Vancouver News. There are a number of underrepresented um, groups who have been part of, a major part of building modern British Columbia. Um, their stories, their lived experience, their history isn't as fully explored, isn't as fully included uh, in what has been a largely uh, European uh, settler narrative. The Royal BC Museum says it will close sections of the First Peoples Gallery as it tries to decolonize that institution. The move comes as Indigenous leaders call on it to make the museum a welcome place for everyone. Earlier this year, the museum's CEO stepped down after allegations of racism from Indigenous staff. The floodgates are opening. Um, athletes and um, victims are feeling more comfortable to come forward, whether that's through the media or through um, an independent complaint management system, which is desperately needed in so many different areas. Calls for more accountability in Canadian sports are growing louder after a former Whitecaps coach was suspended by Jamaica's women's soccer team. A former Caps player claimed to The Guardian that Hubert Busby sexually coerced and assaulted her a decade ago. He denies those allegations. Now Jamaica's Football Federation is asking FIFA, soccer's governing world body, to look into Busby's behavior when he was coaching here in Vancouver. When someone has done nothing, there has to be a way for them to differentiate between the person who actually is breaking the community standards and the person who's been hacked. And my situation is not unique. And I learned that when I was you know, researching this to try and solve it. It's not unique, it happens to a lot of people and it's really unfair. And a North Vancouver real estate agent says it's time for more accountability and transparency from Facebook. After someone hacked her account in August, she was kicked off the platform and WhatsApp accused of posting inappropriate content. But Facebook wouldn't tell her what those posts were, citing privacy. Weeks later, she was suddenly allowed back on, and the company admitted it was a mistake. She wants banned users to at least get a fair hearing. The promises made at the Global Climate Conference in Scotland could have big implications for BC as well as Canada, among other countries. For more, we're joined by Angelia Paterai. She is the Climate Justice Lead with Sierra Club BC, and she joins us from COP in Glasgow. Angelia, let's start with the Prime Minister's pledge that Canada will impose a hard cap, as he calls it, on oil and gas emissions. How do you think that will work practically, if it will? Well, so this news was greeted, um, honestly, not so warmly by a lot of the strongest environmental advocates across the country, firstly, because it's not really a cap, uh, although it's been framed as that. Um, the, the, the actual cap on emissions takes effect in three decades. And so we know already to stay below our 1.5 degree target, as we agree to under the Paris Agreement, this is not in line with the level of ambition that's needed. Um, it doesn't address production. And that's sort of the key message that a lot of environmental advocates are bringing to this COP, is that leaders the world over are, are not really addressing the elephant in the room, which is the production of oil and gas. You know, we're talking about emissions, um, it, it, limits on emissions, and, and we're not really even talking about you know, top-down mandated limits on emissions. We're talking about um, we're talking about incentivized uh, emissions reductions, and then we're not we're not addressing production of oil and gas at all. So, um, the announcement from Canada today was, um, I think, met with a lot of the same sentiment that a lot of the previous um, uh, sort of initiatives of this government have been met with before, which is that sounds great on paper, devil's in the details. 
Let's move on to the pledge to end deforestation by 2030. Plenty of countries have signed on to that. What do you think that could mean here in, in, in Canada, and particularly in B.C.? Uh, the, the, you know, that's a welcome initiative. And, um, you know, we're really glad that Canada's part of this initiative. We're really glad that um, deforestation is starting to be seen as a major climate justice issue. Uh, forest dwelling people and, and, and people who depend on forests around the world uh, welcome some action on this issue. However, it really strikes to the core of, of something that's going to be a very contentious issue and already is at COP26, which is um, the reliance on the efficacy of these initiatives are, are heavily uh, relying on market mechanisms and on offset mechanisms. And so this is um, a real point of contention. Can we really rely on the market um, and on market mechanisms to deliver the actual results that we need, the actual emissions reductions? Can we rely on the market to do something fundamentally different than it has done historically? Have market mechanisms delivered the emissions reductions or, or, or the the true climate action that, that we need and deserve. Unfortunately, the track record um, of this government and of basically all governments around the world have showed that you can't really rely on the market to do that. You've attended COPS since 2010. How does this conference feel compared to others in terms of hope, pessimism, optimism, that kind of thing? Uh, this COP has uh, a lot of attention on it. It's it's probably one of the most hyped um, uh, conference of parties that I've attended, and for good reason. You know, the world uh, is in a very different place. It's been five years since the Paris Agreement, and we're no closer to to our Paris commitments than we than we were in Paris, frankly. And um, climate impacts have been hitting. Uh, vulnerable people and people all over the world. Um, and I'm from BC and we had a summer of climate impacts. We had an unprecedented heat wave, an unprecedented wildfire season. We lost 800 lives to this heat wave. Um, and so uh, I think there's a, a real sense of urgency in the air. There's, there's a, the zeitgeist has moved um, to, to make climate change a top of mind issue for people around the world. And so there's a lot of hope riding on this conference. Angelia Padura, we appreciate your time and perspective. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dan. Does climate activism come from a position of privilege? And does, by its very nature, does it exclude people of color? A one teen activist is aiming to make activism inclusive. That's next. And at 641, a live look at False Creek near the Burrard Bridge. Johanna has her BC-wide weather forecast ahead. And we'll see how many words she has for rain. I'm guessing four. That's next. What happens when a symbol of wealth becomes one of decay? What you're watching is the cleanup of a well. It's minus 30 degrees Celsius with a wind chill, and the closest city is a five hour drive away. This is not an easy job and not for the faint of heart. In Canada alone, there are at least 475,000 conventional oil and gas sites that need to be cleaned up at an estimated cost of 40 to $76 billion. This is a nonpartisan issue. I wonder, do you think that the political will is changing now that we're all having this awakening or, so to speak, like hangover of all these liabilities? There's a perspective in Alberta that um, the oil and gas industry is our poster boy yeah. mm -hmm. and we can't say anything bad about it. After over 100 years, it's time to clean up and we've found ourselves unprepared. You have to look at everything with an open mind. Even the young people, they have to open their mind and look at what this has done for us. Uh, there's over $245 million in unpaid property tax revenue mm -hmm. to municipalities. If a farmer doesn't pay your taxes or a landlord doesn't pay your taxes, you can lose your land. So where is the money and the labour going to come from? How can the public keep the oil industry accountable to clean up? I think the bigger picture is looking seven generations ahead of yourself. It's scary. It's a scary time to be us. Regardless of how many billions of dollars it's going to cost to abandon and reclaim the, everything associated with oil and gas, there's still trillions of dollars of oil and gas left in the ground. What about orphaned wells? Wells that no longer have an owner because its company went bankrupt. Who will clean them?
This story has always seemed odd right from the beginning. And when I say odd, I mean unique. Tourists going missing is unusual. Even just the fact she had a bright a pink parka. When it comes to tourists in Yellowknife, especially Japanese tourists, they usually come as a group. And they're usually well protected, well cared for, well, well welcomed. It would almost seem impossible that someone could go missing. That's Simi's case was definitely the first case I ever heard of in my nine years here. Some of those articles at the time were saying, um, you know, it's one of those destinations where you plan to disappear, but I don't know how many people I know that have planned to come to Yellowknife to disappear. Two years after you cover most stories, you understand what happened. This one, we're still making guesses. That's unusual for us. Time for our BC Wide Weather Forecast with meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff. You're out of the damp. Thank goodness. Thank goodness, yes. I mean, I, I like to just mm -hmm. check it out mm -hmm. and then retreat to the radar. Oh, I come think, on. Uh... You've got like 18 <laughs> different rain slickers. We all know that in various colors. Thank you for noting that, yes, Dan, <laughs> what kind of meteorologist would I be if I didn't have a few to rotate through? We'll just um, keep that between you and I. Yeah, just uh, don't let that get out there. Um, you're going to need all the raincoats you've got for the week ahead, but I actually want to start off with temperatures. Another little story that we're tracking this week, uh, starting off with the big picture. We're above seasonal right now. In fact, some of the warmest temperatures across the country happening in through Western Canada, 11 in Vancouver right now, 13 for Calgary. Uh, look at that temperature shift, though, as you get down towards Regina and Winnipeg and notice the minus temperatures for places like Ottawa and Thunder Bay. We'll come back to them in a, in, in a moment, but I want to take you to the long range temperature trend here on the West Coast. The warmer colors, the yellows, above seasonal temperatures. Once we get into the blues and purples, as I time this out, that's the Arctic air mass. So getting you through Thursday and Friday, notice we start to see the first Arctic air mass descend across parts of the province. Now the heart of it will stay up towards the north, Northwest, but we will see modified air uh, circulate down through the province Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So seeing some of our coldest air yet, and that will drop snow levels. Uh, at this point, just looking at the uh, locals, we're not looking at anything for Valley Bottom, but uh, I'll time that out in a quick moment. Just wanted to take you back to the Great Lakes. The lake effect machine is on. Uh, we have relatively open, warm waters right now, and they're getting the first blast of Arctic air. It's the temperature difference over the lake that leads those narrow bands of snow. Uh, on the lee shores of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay, seen uh, 20 to 30 centimeters in just a few hours. So that's what's happening to the east of us. Arctic air is descending all over the place. Uh, rainfall accumulation for us through to Friday morning. Uh, looking at a general 40 to 60 millimeters, not quite making warning criteria. Our rainfall warnings have ended. As I mentioned earlier, this is the third night. We will have rain, though, through the overnight. Taking you through Thursday, a fresh low pressure system moving in Friday. There we go. Uh, Saturday, another pulse of moisture. Uh, our producer asked if we were uh, getting payback for such a lovely Halloween weekend, and I think that's fair. Mm -hmm. 11 and through Kelowna tomorrow, 9 for Cranbrook. Look at that long range. <laughs> yep, rain after rain. Woo. Dan, I'm hoping I can uh, change that icon on Sunday, mm. maybe add a few sunny breaks mm -hmm. in there, but not confident enough to do it yet. Check in with me tomorrow. Copy-paste on those graphics. You got it. Control C all the way. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. <laughs> You're welcome. So you may have heard of the sustainability teens, young people across our province united by the urgency to stop global climate catastrophe. In a four-part series with our Creator Network, we spoke with members of the movement who all have a different take on how to be a climate crisis activist. Tonight we meet an organizer who shares how the movement can become more inclusive.
My name is Naisha Khan, and I am a second-generation Bangladeshi settler on stolen and unceded Kwantlen, Kaiti, and Semiamu land. I've been a climate justice organizer for nearly two years with the organization Sustainability Teens and Banking on a Better Future. And in this episode, I'm going to explore through my personal experiences why it is essential to view the movement through an intersectional lens. When we imagine climate activists, we often imagine someone who is white, and this is intentional. The climate movement, specifically starting with the conservation movement, is deeply rooted in white supremacy. From the outset, it focused on saving the environment from the effects of climate change, but in doing so, it has failed to protect the racialized communities affected by the same environmental degradation. It has erased these struggles and the inequity that they experience as their communities have been ravaged by climate change. This history of exclusion impacts BIPOC in the climate movement. Our work continues to be erased, white supremacy continues to manifest, and it continues to harm BIPOC. I have personally experienced micro and macro aggressions, tokenism, and just a general lack of cultural understanding that has made me want to leave this movement at times. I feel like a resource or a prop often asked to speak up about any race-related issue, whether it be BLM or indigenous sovereignty, because I am just automatically categorized as this non-white organizer, regardless of the fact that the struggles of different communities and individuals are unique. Despite this reality, there are still times when I have felt safe, heard, and respected in this movement. And the key to these spaces was an understanding of intersectionality. But what is intersectionality? The concept of intersectionality was coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw in her paper, Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex. Intersectionality recognizes that we live in a society characterized by multiple systems of oppression, including sexism, colonialism, and racism. And these systems are all intertwined. These systems of oppression do not work exclusively to oppress one specific group at a time, but instead overlap and work together to compound oppression for intersecting groups. Within the climate movement, we need to be aware of and take action to deconstruct these systems of oppression. Otherwise, we are replicating the same systems of colonialism and capitalism that caused this crisis in the first place. The key to successful inclusive movements that center marginalized voices is intersectionality. Here are some of my asks to ensure intersectionality is upheld. Center and uplift BIPOC voices. No matter how educated you are, you'll never have the lived experience of someone else. You'll never truly understand their emotions or the depth of their oppression. So instead of speaking for others, work to uplift marginalized voices so that they can speak for themselves. This is especially important because BIPOC communities are at the center of the climate crisis and have extensive knowledge and lived experience to share. Unlearn white supremacy, but not at the cost of my emotional labor. There are so many existing resources out there, Black, Indigenous, and POC written content that you can find online. Do not unnecessarily labor the BIPOC folk in your life because this work is hard for us. It is tiring and I'm more than just a resource. I'm a person who needs rest and care. Incorporating hope. Indigenous and other communities of color have been practicing sustainability for years, whilst building mutual aid and other practices of community care. We have the solution, we just need to center different voices to make it a reality. And lastly, celebrate BIPOC joy. Too often racialized folk are reduced to sob stories and to our traumas when, in fact, we're full-fledged people capable of experiencing joy and love. For me, I am slowly starting to center joy in my organizing. Systems of oppression are rooted in hate. Hate for the other, hate for ourselves. But by centering joy, especially as a marginalized person, I am committing an act of anti-oppression. When fighting the climate crisis, it is absolutely necessary to use an intersectional and anti-oppressive lens. This both works to center marginalized and racialized voices, but it also works to dismantle centuries of oppression that caused this emergency in the first place. 
I know it may seem like a lot to care about all of these different issues when one just wants to fight for climate action, but this crisis did not just occur, and its impacts will not occur equally. The systems of oppression that caused this in the first place will also shape its effects, and in order to truly combat it, we must unite movements, because our fight is not separate. Our liberation is bound together. She's 87 years young, and this senior is not resting on any laurels. How she became the oldest graduate of York University. Her story's next. Quite. There's an eagle over your head. Oh, I do. I'm with Simon Dontremont. He is always waiting for the right shot. His photos are stunning. So there's three bald eagles. I'm with Simone at the Canso Causeway because this is migration time for the Atlantic Sorry fish. It's a photographer and bird watcher's dream. And you'll see many people along the Causeway rocks for the next few weeks because the Sorry fish is a perfect feast for the bald eagles, the northern gannets, cormorants, and there's others here for the fish meal too. Oh, there's the gray seal as well, right in front of us. Oh. <laughs> he might have missed that shot, but when the seal reappears, he's ready. It's, it's challenging, it's, it's hard work, sometimes in extreme environments, but when you're able to get a great photo, it, it creates a bit of a reward. For Simone, diving into the world of wildlife photography is different than the beautiful landscapes he also shoots. Getting this takes patience. These dolphins jumping in the Strait of Canso? You have to be aimed and ready with the button, and when we see them jump, hit the button, so you actually have to hold your lens to in the air, pointing at them while you're waiting. But it isn't just his still shots that caught my eye. He started experimenting with video. Check this out, a flock of sandpipers trying to escape a peregrine falcon. I was hand-holding this lens, trying to catch a falcon diving at a couple hundred kilometers per hour after a flock of several hundred uh, sandpipers who were moving in erratic directions to avoid being caught. As if patiently waiting for the wildlife to create some magic for him isn't enough, his other passion is astrophotography. The Milky Way over the Skyline Trail is something he's planned for for the last couple of years. He's self-taught, been at it for six years now, and in retirement sells his prints. Plus, because of so many requests, he's launched a 2022 calendar. To create all of this, takes time and patience. It's that popular misconception that wildlife photography is a glamorous hobby because the photos are so beautiful, but my saying is it, it's not as pretty behind the camera uh, than it is in front of the camera because often it means lying in the mud, putting up with mosquito bites and putting up with cold weather. All to get the perfect shot and then chase it again the next day. Colleen Jones, CBC News at the Canso Causeway. It's a cliche, you're never too old to go back to school, but one woman in Vaughan, Ontario, keeps proving that to be true. As Natalie Calatta reports, the 87-year-old is the oldest person to ever earn a graduate degree from York University. Among York University's 2021 graduates, Bharatha Lechami Shamuganathan, the personification of the adage, it's never too late. From the age of four, I should say, I started my educational journey. And up to this time, I have been a student. 
At 87 years old, Varada Shanmagunadan has earned her second master's degree, this one in political science, inspired by Gandhi and the search for peace. So I thought I could tell the world that peace, justice, and nonviolence should prevail. So to say this loud, I had to get that tool. Now I've got the tool, so I'm going to talk loud. The journey to get her degree began two years ago. The grandmother headed to York's campus, matriculating with her younger classmates. Yeah, because they were energetic. Uh, I felt uh, rejuvenated and uh, happy to talk to them. And some of them came and uh, treated me like their own grandma. <laughs> And when the pandemic hit, like the rest of the students, she pivoted to online learning. So that means you can adjust. Anybody can adjust. And she isn't done yet. Shem Gunadon plans to write a book based off her research on post-war Sri Lanka and prospects for peace. Learning and search for knowledge can never stop. We learn that much and there is a lot in front of us, like an ocean, knowledge. So you can go on and on and on. And she plans to. Natalie Collada, CBC News, Toronto. Well done. Thanks for joining us on CBC Vancouver News at 6. You can always catch our cast on CBC Gym, the free app. We're also on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram or on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Your next local news is on at 11 o'clock tonight, right after the National with Isabel Regan. Take care.